O foolish Galatians. I almost said Moose Javians, but I'll just get Galatians. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus' death was made as clear to you as if you'd seen a picture of his death on the cross. This is some pretty strong words. Foolish Galatians. And, and scholars tell us that the actual words used there in the Greek language, they have sort of a strength to them, you fools, but they also have a kind of endearment to them. They're spoken in love. One version says it this way, you dear idiots. <laughs> We're on week two of a series in the book of Galatians, and this is uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul writing. He's written about a third of the New Testament, a whole bunch of letters, and what's unique about this particular letter, way more than any other letter he wrote, Paul is aggressive, he's passionate, he's intense, he's extremely confrontational in the way that he writes this book called Galatians, and yet he's trying to be careful, he's trying to talk to them in a way that won't push them away, but will win their hearts, and so he's got this kind of two-pronged approach, he's really direct and really intense about his approach, but he's also pastoral, he's trying to win their hearts and, and, and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm being this intense with you, I'm being this... Uh, 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 straightforward with you because I love you and because I'm concerned for you. And Paul is super concerned. This is not some small issue that he's dealing with. This isn't just one of those things that he says, you know, hey, I got to remind you guys about this. He's hugely concerned. He says, everything's at stake in the issue that I want to write to you about. Um, he is convinced that their very souls are at stake. And the word he uses to talk about uh, what's at stake for the Galatian Christians is he uses the word freedom. It's kind of fun, whenever you study a book of the Bible, you can ask yourself, what's the key word to this book? Well, in Galatians, it's the word freedom. Over and over again, it just freedom, 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 freedom gets brought up. Or its counterpart, enslavement. And Paul says, I'm so concerned that your freedom is going to be lost and that it's going to damn your very souls. I mean, that's how strong he feels about this. And not just you, but the people who would follow after you, your kids and grandkids and so on. It's a big deal. Now, you know, the truth is, in our day, people will die for freedom. People fight for freedom. In fact, we live in a nation that we ought to be thankful for, for the kind of freedom that we enjoy, and people paid a price for the freedom that we enjoy in our nation. In fact, uh, many of the wars that take place all around the world, one of the battle cries of wars that happen around the world and people laying down their lives around the world is the battle cry for freedom. Uh, but the Apostle Paul here is in a battle for a freedom that he considers and that the Bible teaches is even more important, even more vital, even more worth dying for or fighting for than political kinds of freedom. Uh, this is a freedom that's spoken of through all the Bible. Jesus certainly talked about freedom. He said, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed or is really free, truly free, that the truest kind of freedom a human being can experience is not political freedom. The truest kind of freedom, the deepest kind of freedom, the most important and vital kind of freedom a human being can experience is the kind that Christ sets us free. He comes and he sets captives free. Sets every one of us, every human being is captivating. You say, well, that's great, but what does he free me from? You know, what is this freedom from? What's the enslavement? And of course, Scripture teaches that we're freed from ourselves. Right? We're freed from our own sins, certainly. Uh, we're freed from the judgment and wrath of God upon our sins. That's something to get freed from. Uh, we get freed from the curse and the results of sin and this evil world, and that's certainly talked about. But what's fascinating about this passage of Scripture, about the book of Galatians, is one of the things that is emphasized here that we are freed from is something that we're not too used to getting freed from, or we're not too sure we even want to get freed from. Uh, what Paul is talking about here is what he would call freedom from religion. <laughs> freedom from religion. And you're kind of like, well, what does that mean to get freed from religion? Well, religion is really a system of do's and don'ts that try to enable us to get right with God. You see, every human being on the planet knows there's something wrong. There's something wrong with me, and there's something wrong between me and my Creator. And human beings have worked uh, for, since the beginning of time to try to figure that out. And so we create systems. We create ladders that we climb. And we say, well, if I just did this and this and this and this, I could right my wrongs. 
I, I could fix the messes that I've made. I, I, I just got to find the right system to God, the right ladder to God, the right stairway to heaven. <laughs> right? And if I could just come up with that stairway, if I could just figure out that ladder, then everything would be okay. And, and you've heard people say, you know, every religion is basically the same. Well, in this sense, it's true. Every religion is man's way to get to God. But the trouble with religion, this is what Jesus says, it's what the Apostle Paul says, in fact, it's what the whole of Scripture says from beginning to end, the trouble with religion is that it doesn't work. That no matter how hard we try to right our wrongs, no matter how hard we try to be good enough for God, to get to God, we fail. We can't do it. No one has ever gotten themselves to God by climbing the ladder of goodness. And so we need to be freed from it. Why do we need to be freed from it? Because climbing the ladder of goodness, attempting by my do's and don'ts to get to God, does not leave me free, it leaves me guilty. It leaves me condemned. It leaves me carrying a burden that I cannot carry. And it creates a hierarchy in the way I relate, not just to God, debt-debtor type relationship, I've got to pay him back. But it creates a debt-debtor relationship in all my human relationships. And so human beings do this. We relate to each other like rungs on a ladder. You're either above me or you're below me. And so either kind of, whoa, look at that person. We envy or we look down on people with pride. And we say, oh, I'm not as bad as that person. Look at that, what that person does. And you know, the sad thing is religion actually makes us prejudice. It, it makes us look at people uh, in, in hierarchical senses. It's the results of religion. Debt, debtor type relations. I've paid more than they've paid. I've done more than they've done. And yet if you went around Moose Jaw today and you were to ask people, how are you doing with God? Are you right with God? You know what the average answer would be in our city? They'd say, well, I hope so. And then if you were to say, well, what, what, what makes you think you, you might be right with God? They'd say, well, I've been a pretty good person. Pretty good compared to the next guy anyway. I'm kind of hoping God grades on the curve, <laughs> right? And that's the problem with religion. It doesn't get us anywhere. It only gets us to guilt and to carrying burdens we can't carry and to treating each other in hierarchical ways. And that's where the gospel of grace comes in. That rather than us trying to climb to God, the Bible says God came to us in Jesus. That, that, that instead of us figuring out what we have to do to get to God, God came and said, I'll do what needs to be done on your behalf. Instead of us climbing to God, God comes to us and he offers us uh, his saving work, a right relationship with him as a gift, as what he calls grace, an undeserved favor, an undeserved present given to you and me. He says, you can't climb it, you can't pay for it, you can't earn it, but you can receive it. And that's why the gospel includes the word faith. Because faith is what, says, is what says, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. I am just going to take my hands off of my self-capacities, my self-righteousness, my self-madeness, and I'm going to reach out to what God has already done. I'm going to reach towards the cross. I'm going to reach to God. And He's going to be my Savior. I'm not going to save myself. God is going to save me. God's going to rescue me. That's what faith does. Faith lays hold of God's provision on my behalf for free. Just receives it. Now, what Paul is saying in these first two chapters here is he's saying that the Galatians, they get this. They understand that God has grace and that God forgives and that God has come down. But then they said, well, you know, that's really good and we get that, but we want to add a few rungs to the ladder too. We, we want to kind of come up with a, a hybrid version. We're going to relate to God based on the cross and we're going to do a few things to earn it and deserve it. It's as if they've taken the gift from God and then they gave it back to God and said, okay, now let me pay for it. Now let me earn it. And Paul says, you know what? When you take the gospel and, and you take grace and you add something to grace, it's no longer grace. As soon as you pay for the gift, it's no longer a free gift. And so he says, what you've done is you, you, you think you've just enhanced the gospel, but in reality, you've missed the gospel altogether. It's no gospel at all. So salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The way he says it 
in Galatians 2.16 is he says, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And the way we can know whether we're relating to God out of grace or whether we're relating to God out of works or out of our own flesh, the way we can know it is just by looking at some of the symptoms in our lives. And this is what we talked about last week. If we find ourselves relating to God with guilt and condemnation, you know, whoa, God's going to get me, then we know we've moved away from this way of relating to God from grace to works. If we find ourselves carrying a burden about God's path for our lives, God's will for our lives, God's design for our lives, if we start to relate to God like it's so, such a burden to serve Him, then we know we've left grace, we've moved into works. If we find ourselves being judgmental or proud or, or, or living on this hierarchical scale with other human beings around us, then we know, hey, 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 we're leaving grace. Here, we're, we're heading to a different system, a religious system. Uh, but now in Galatians chapter 3, as Paul continues the letter, he adds another layer to this thing called grace. He adds another layer to living under the cross rather than by works. And he says, you know what? The truth is, you don't just start with God with the cross. You don't just begin the Christian life in grace and by faith laying a hold of God's capacity on your behalf. Actually, you continue the same way. Actually, every step forward in the Christian life is a step forward in the grace of God. You, you don't start here and go, yeah, yeah, okay, God saved me, God forgave me, God gave me the free gift of eternal life. Now I'm going to work for him. Now I'm going to earn it. Now I'm going to deserve it. Now, God, what's the formula? Because God won't relate to you based on a formula. He just refuses to. And so grace is the way you start, but grace is also the way you continue. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to work through, again, a large passage of Scripture like we did last week. Now, the first five verses, they set up the whole rest of the passage. So we're going to look at the first five verses and the invitation to not just begin the, li the Christian life by uh, grace, but to continue it. So here we go, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you'd seen a picture of his death on the cross. So you know what the Apostle Paul is doing here? He's saying, look it, you didn't just know that Jesus died for you. You had a sense of that was a reality in your life. Um, it was vividly portrayed to you. There was a sense in which it wasn't just a theological principle, but it was a, a vivid reality. See, a person embraces the cross not when they accept it as a historical fact. A person embraces the work of Christ when they don't, they don't just say Jesus died uh, on the cross for sin, but when they say Jesus died on the cross for my sin. My sin. When the cross becomes vividly portrayed in my life. And so Paul goes, that's how you got in. That's how you started this Christian life. And then verse 2. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit. How? Because you believed the message you heard about Christ. You appropriated it by faith. You believed it, and it became yours. That's how you got in. That's how you got the Spirit of God in your life. There was no formula. There was no system that you followed. You simply embraced by faith the finished work of Christ on the cross, and you said, that's for me, and you took it. How foolish can you be, verse 3, after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? You know, Galatians 3.3 has been one of the Bible verses that God has brought me back to over and over and over again in my Christian life. Where I've just gone, you know, it's so easy for me to start trying to serve God in my own strength, in my own capacity, in my own abilities. It's so easy for me to try to be my own savior in any given area of my life. And what Paul just goes, he goes, you know, it's so foolish to think that the one who saved you has now abandoned you and now you got to figure it all out on your own. Don't try to continue the Christian life in your own strength. Don't try to continue the Christian life uh, by, by climbing the ladder. Instead, the same way you got saved, the same way you got in by looking away from yourself and looking to Christ and His finished work is the same way you're going to grow. 
It's by looking away from yourself and leaning into God's provision on your behalf. You start in grace, you grow in grace, you continue in grace. Verse 4, have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. So he says, not only did you start with grace and God's capacity on your behalf, not only do you continue that way, but you know what? If you want God to work in your life today, you want to see God do a miracle in your life today, change your heart, set you free, change something about your world, you don't need to approach God and ask him what the four things you need to do is. You don't need to look for some formula or magic incantation that you can offer to God so that he'll do a miracle for you. No, no. He's your father. He relates to you by grace. And the only way God ever does a miracle in anybody's life is as a free gift. He's Savior. He's King. And so he goes, if you want God to work, the way he works is by him getting to be God and us being on the receiving end. That's how God operates in your life. It's how he started in your life. It's how he continues in your life. And it's how he'll work in your life today. Now, that's the argument. Grace, you never leave it behind. You never leave it behind. You start with it, you grow in it, you continue in it. It's the only way. And what he's going to do for the rest of this passage, and we're going to follow a whole bunch of verses here, is he's just going to keep driving this point home through various uh, arguments. And so we're going to walk through four of them together. And it was funny, actually, as I was preparing uh, to do this series, I was praying, like, you know, what's the next series we should do? And I really felt to do Galatians. And I kind of argued with God about that because Galatians is actually a, one of the tougher books in the New Testament to uh, preach through. I thought, you know, that's better for seminary, Lord, not for church, you know. And then as I was praying through uh, uh, this series and preparing it, um, I, I wanted to just do it with themes, you know, just preach on the various themes in Galatians. But again, I felt like, no, we need to just go through it verse by verse. And so uh, you're going to just be an awesome, mature, kind of great church that's going to work us verse by verse through this. All right. I can tell. You're tough. You're a good bunch. So let's do it. We're going to go through a good swath of Scripture together here to, uh, today, and uh, we're going to allow God to argue for grace in our lives. So the first argument that is made is the promise comes by faith. Starts here in verse 6. In the same way, Abraham believed God and counted him as righteous, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. That's how Abraham became right with God. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. So Paul just uses a smart argument here. He goes, hey, anybody who considers themselves part of, of God's family or relating to God sees Abraham as their father. They're like, yeah, Abraham's the guy. He was the first guy who figured this out, got right with God, and now we follow in his footsteps. But Paul goes, you know what the truth is? You don't become uh, one of, of Abraham's seed or a person in the lineage of Abraham by your genetic code. You become a person in the lineage of Abraham by faith, the same way Abraham did. And Abraham didn't relate to God b based on what he did. It was just a promise given to him, an unconditional promise. There was no ifs. There was no like, you got to do this and this and this, Abraham, and then I'll bless you. No, it was just a one-way promise. To Abraham. In fact, Abraham never even got circumcised until over a decade later. Even the covenant God made with Abraham, you know when God cut covenant with Abraham? Normally a covenant is cut between two people. They each participate and they each do their part. You know how Abraham's covenant with God worked? God cut the covenant while Abraham slept. <laughs> it's just God's way of saying this is a one-way deal. This is grace deal. Verse 8, what's more, the scriptures looked forward to the time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed because of you. So uh, God prophesied about our day now where we would uh, put our faith in God and be made righteous. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey the commandments that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. He's repeated this several times now, right? There's no way to climb the ladder. Nobody can get there that way. No one's capable of it. The law shows the way there, but no human being can do it. 
For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it's through obeying the law that a person has life. So the law says, if you want the promises, if you want the blessings and not to have the curses, there's a whole ton of requirements. There's a whole bunch of if-thens. If you do this and this and this, then God will do this and this and this. If you do this and this and this, then God will do this and this and this. And he just goes, that's great, but nobody can do it. Nobody has ever pulled it off except for one person, one human, Jesus. He's the only one who's ever pulled it off. And this is what Jesus did when he pulled it off, verse 13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced in the law when he hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Through Jesus Christ, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. And so that's the whole message of the cross. Jesus fulfilled the law in his own life and then as a perfect sacrifice offered uh, himself to pay for your sins and my sins. He received the curse of your sins and my sins upon himself that we might receive the blessing that he deserved. Pretty awesome. It's the message of the gospel. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave promises to Abraham and to his child. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant to many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, and that, of course, means Christ. So he says Jesus was prophesied about even back then. This is what I'm trying to say. This agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise, but God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. You're like, whoa, what does all that mean? Okay, promises are received by believing them. The the law's blessings are received by obedience. But then he's saying, so Abraham, way before the law, received the promise, and he related rightly to God by faith. But then Moses comes along hundreds of years later and he gets a law from who? Who did the law come from? Somebody want to tell us? Anybody know who the law came from? God, sure. God is the one who gave Moses the law. And so you might say, well, if God gave us the law and told us if, 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 then, 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 well, then why are you trying to cancel the law? I I thought God gave it to us. And maybe Abraham was the one way to relate to God until Moses came along, and now that's the right way to relate to God. And Paul says, no, no, no. The the first covenant is not nullified by the, the giving of the law. But then you ask the question, wouldn't you? Okay, so what's the point of this law then? I mean, if Abraham related to God by faith and God saved him, and then a few hundred years later, this law came with if, 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 then, 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 but we're not supposed to do the law because we can't do the law, and so we just got to go back to Abraham. Well, then what in the world were you thinking, God, by giving this law thing? Oh, look it. The very next verse asks the same question. Verse 19. Why then was the law given? Good question, Paul. I was just asking the same thing. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was a mediator between God and his people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. We do something, God does something. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. It was one way. Is there conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we would be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. So why then the law? What was God doing when he gave us the law? He was pointing out that we can't keep it. He was showing us that we need a Savior. He was bringing us to the end of ourselves to see our own sinfulness. The law is like a mirror. We we hold up the law before us and it says, God is actually here. 
And it's amazing how we human beings can self-justify ourselves, can't we? we? We love to think we're pretty good. I'm okay, especially when I compare myself with somebody worse than me. And the law just goes, okay, here's the standard. Now how are you doing? <laughs> and we're going to go, uh, 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 well... And this is so hard for us because we don't want to admit the mess in our hearts. We like covering it up. We like pretending it's not there. We like trying to do a few good things so that we can kind of say, see, see, I'm okay. And so God gives us the law and he says, no, you're not okay. You need a savior. It pushes us to Christ. It's a mirror that shows us the dirt on our faces. You ever tried to wash your face with a mirror? It doesn't work, right? You scrub up against it. You can't do it. And the law can't make you righteous. It can just show you that you're not righteous. That's all it can do for you. Maybe it'll help to read this quote. It's a rather long quote, but I, I think it's very well done. Sorry, the second argument there. The first argument, the promises by faith. The second argument, the law is still useful. Okay, It's still useful not to make you righteous, not so that you can follow it to a T, but it's still useful to show you your sin. So here's, here's how this can be explained. This is John Stott. After God gave the promise to Abraham, he gave the law to Moses. Why? Simply because he had to make things worse before he could make them better. The law exposed sin, provoked sin, condemned sin. The purpose of the law was, as it were, to lift the lid off man's respectability and to disclose what he was really like underneath. Sinful, rebellious, guilty under the judgment of God, and helpless to save himself. Man, we don't like hearing that. But that's exactly what the law tells us. And the law must be allowed to do this, to do its God-given duty today. One of the great faults of the contemporary church is the tendency to soft-pedal sin and judgment. But we must never bypass the law and come straight to the gospel. To do so is to contradict the plan of God in biblical history. God knew what he was doing by going promise, law, cross. And we need to go on the same path. No man has ever appreciated the gospel until the law has first revealed him to himself. It is only against the inky blackness of the night sky that the stars begin to appear. And it is only against the dark background of sin and judgment that the gospel shines forth. Not until the law has bruised and smitten us will we admit our need of the gospel to bind up our wounds. Not until the law has arrested and imprisoned us will we pine for Christ to set us free. Not until the law has condemned and killed us will we call upon Jesus Christ for justification in life. Not until the law has driven us to despair of ourselves will we ever believe in Jesus. Do you see that? Do you see how we have to come to the end of ourselves? We have to be desperate enough that we're drowning before we reach out for a Savior. And so the law is a gift to you. The realization that your heart is rebellious and wicked and sinful. As hard as it is to realize, as tough as it is to look in that mirror and see the dirt there, it's a gift. And we don't like it. The Bible calls it an offense. It's hard for us to accept and it's hard for us to admit. But when we admit it and we fall at our feet and just say, God, help me. I can't do this. It's then that grace looks great. It's then that the Savior is great. It's then that the gospel shines forth brightly. And I would just challenge you here. Maybe you've never seen that before. Maybe you've always kind of relied on your own goodness and figured, well, I'm trying pretty hard. I'm doing pretty good. The invitation of God to you is to look at his holiness and to look at your place and to see your own insufficiency, your own sin, and to come running to the foot of the cross of our Savior and to say, God alone, God alone. I heard a story this week of a gal who was in her 20s. She grew up in church. She grew up hearing all this stuff, praying the right prayers, becoming a Christian, getting baptized, learning the Bible. And she was a nice Christian kid. In her 20s, she was in a Bible study in another nice Christian church. And as she was sitting in that Bible study and studying the book of Romans, they got about halfway through, which deals with these very issues. And she came to her group the next week and she said, I got saved, I got saved this week. And they all kind of laughed and said, yeah, yeah, right. She goes, no, for real. I never saw it before. I always just thought I was a pretty good person. Now I get it. He's a savior. But let me challenge you a little bit again here. 
Maybe to you, you think about the cross and you look at the cross and you believe it, but it doesn't appear glorious to you. Grace isn't amazing and wonderful to you. To which I would say, maybe you need God to bring you the law afresh. To show you your own lostness and depravity and rebellion and helplessness without Him afresh. Because the cross looks glorious in light of our sin. So there's the purpose of the cross. Grace, it can be defended by Abraham's promise. Grace can be defended by the law's usefulness. The next thing Paul uses to defend grace is the freedom that a child of God has. Verse 26, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And you have been united with Christ in baptism. You've put on Christ or you've been baptized into Christ. Like putting on new clothes. So what's happened here is now you've identified yourself so closely with Jesus that God looks at you through Christ. You, you clothe yourself in his righteousness rather than your own. You hang on to him rather than yourself. And what happens? Then there's no longer Jew or Gentile. Right? You, you, there's no hierarchies going on anymore. You just stand at the foot of the cross. You're clothed in Jesus. Jews clothed in Jesus. Gentiles clothed in Jesus. There's no longer slave or free. Again, there's no class divisions anymore. There's not rich and poor, this and that. Good person, bad person. There's none of that. There's no male or female. Of course, in, in the day that this scripture was written, uh, there was a major hierarchical difference between male and female. Right? And God uh, uh, just says, <laughs> we're all the same before him. That doesn't mean you're no longer the race you are. It doesn't mean you're no longer in the life situation you're in, slave or free in this case. It doesn't mean you're no longer a male or a female. Whew, right? That'd be kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, awkward. Okay, just work with me, church. Is everybody here? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean that. It just means the way you relate to God is no difference. The hierarchies are broken down. Right? <laughs> Jeez. Verse 29. And now you belong to Jesus. You are true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. You're a child now. You just relate to God like one of his kids. Think of it this way. If a father dies, this is chapter 4, verse 1, and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those who are children are not much better off than the slaves until they grow up, even though they had actually uh, owned everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that is the way it is with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic principles of this world. Uh, let me just pause there because I skipped a, a few verses early on that continued talking about the law and how it was our guardian before Christ came and then we didn't need the guardian anymore. And Paul uh, redoes this theme here. It's an interesting thing in the Old Testament. It keeps prophesying about a day when God will write his laws in our hearts. Keep saying, there's going to come a day when you don't need all these external structures, all these ceremonies, all these outer things. You're going to have the law written right on, on your heart. And, and so what he's saying here is he's saying, you know, uh, sometimes you need outer boundaries. Um, in parenting classes, we'll, we'll talk about how a, a little kid, like a two, three, four-year-old, um, there's not a whole lot of love of what's right in a little kid. Uh, mostly, a little kid does the right thing and doesn't do the wrong thing. Why? Because they don't want to get in trouble, right? And so mostly the way you train a little child is just with punishment and rewards. I mean, that's about it. And little kids just learn. Oh, if I do that, I get in trouble. If I do this, I get good stuff. And that's, that's kind of how a little kid. But as a kid grows, what are you hoping will happen? You're, you're hoping that as they grow up, they're no longer just doing things out of fear of reproof. You're hoping that they're going to start doing things out of love of virtue. You're hoping that one day you'll be able to remove every rule from their life can you imagine? They could just do anything they want. It's called adulthood, right? <laughs> and they'll still do the right things. That would be awesome. That's exactly what God wants to do for you, right? Not, it's not about all the structure and the boundaries and the rules. You follow and serve him and so on. And that's going to come out in chapter 5 and 6 in a, in a big way, but there's a hint of it here. Verse 4, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. 
Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. She says, you don't relate to God like a slave anymore. Kind of head down, hoping you don't get in trouble, trying to climb, trying to do it all right. No, you relate to God like his own child. In fact, he says, it's not just like Father God. It's, it's Daddy. It's the most intimate word for Father you can get. And, and then he says something awesome here because up until now we've had Jesus and the strength of the Spirit, but he says something cool here. He says, it's by the Spirit of God that we realize our childhood before God. Jesus positionally makes us children of God. But it's the Spirit of God who subjectively makes that a reality to us or allows us to experience it in a real way in our daily lives. Now, let me share this with you with a, a quote from uh, John MacArthur. He says, God is not some distant person. God is daddy in the most intimate sense of the term. God sent his son so that we might receive the status of sonship. But God sent his spirit so that we might confidently know the experience of that sonship. The spirit of God comes, makes it real to our hearts. The confirmation of sonship is the indwelling spirit. So grace is defended by Abraham's promise. It's just a promise. It's a one-way deal. You just receive. Grace is defended by the law's helpfulness. The law is just a mirror. It shows us how desperately we need grace. Grace is defended by the children's freedom. You just relate to God like his own child. He's Abba Father. And then the last way that Paul defends grace is just by sharing his heart with them. So he just gets a little more personal here. And he says, Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that did not exist. So now you know God, or should I say God knows you. Again, emphasizing God comes to us. God reaches us. Why do you want to go back again and become slaves to the more weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. He says, man... It's so tempting for us to try to put God in a formula box because then he's neat and he, it works and, and you don't have to struggle and, and it's, it's sort of, we're, we're more comfortable on this path. Here we're just desperate and needy. <laughs> just hands up, that's all I know to do. But here, so we, we go back to this. He says, don't go back. Don't try to make it into a formula with God. You know, we do this in our relationships, true. You ever seen husbands and wives like this? They get in a fight and things aren't going right and they just kind of go, well, just tell me exactly what you want. Just give me the four things I need to do. I'll do them and then, well, relationship will be figured out. Yeah. I'll buy you flowers. <laughs> Take you on a date for crying out loud. What else do you need? <laughs> right? You imagine if you try to relate that way? Okay, here's your flowers. <laughs> well, thank you. That's so sweet. Yeah, well, I had to. Right? <laughs> Supposed to. Yeah, it doesn't work. But we try to go back into that system. God, would you do a work in my life? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, what do I have to do to get it? And again, we end up in a system of works instead of relying on God's goodness and faithfulness. <laughs> okay, verse 11. I fear for you, perhaps all my work for you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do, for freedom from these things, for I have become like you Gentiles, free from these laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn away. No, you took me in, you cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Jesus Christ himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? He just goes, guys, remember how we used to relate to each other? It wasn't some competition. It wasn't some who's the bad, who's this, who's that. It was just grace. We, I served you, you served me. Do you remember that? Do you remember the, the kind of heart we had there? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it would have been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They're trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, but that's okay. But let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. I feel like I'm giving birth to you again. This is painful, he says. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your life or until Christ is formed in you. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone. He says, man, I wish you could hear how I feel about this. I'm so passionate about it. But at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. So I'm just going to write this as best I can. 
And so he ends this passage or this argument of inviting them to uh, do their work relying on the Spirit and not on their own self by just saying, I just want Christ formed in you. I just want Christ formed. I want more and more of Jesus in you. You you got saved by looking away from yourself and looking to Jesus. And I want you to keep doing that every day so that your life, as you grow, you just go, it's less of me, it's more of him. It's less of me, it's more of him. Remember John the Baptist said that? He must increase and I must decrease. And he says, that's what I want for you. That's what I'm laboring for for you. That's what my prayer is for you, that your life would be more and more Jesus, more and more centered around him, more and more finding your strength and your sustenance and your joy in your life there. So if you want to continue the Christian life, you want to grow, you want to get to the next step, you want to become more holy, more fully alive, more of a blessing to other people, more close to God, more full of the Holy Spirit. You want any of those things? You just need to look away from self more and look to Jesus more. You just become more radically Christ-centered, more full of Christ, more developed, more, more Christ, more formed in you. In fact, just a few verses before this passage, and we'll close with this. He uses these very words about his own life in Christ. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. See, that's what he wants for them. Christ in you. He's the strength. He's the capacity. He's the one who, 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 who you feed on and who you find your life in. And every day, every day, you just get up in the morning and you go, I'm looking away from self, I'm looking to Christ. You, you don't go from faith to works or from faith to flesh. The Bible says in Romans 1.17, you go from faith to faith, to faith, to faith, to faith. You just keep grasping more of who God is on your behalf. That's the way. Christ lives in me and the life I live in the flesh now, I live by faith. That's how I live. My faith is in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so rather than doing things in our own efforts and our own strength and trying to get move forward like that, we say, you know what? It's got to be by the Spirit. It's like we, we start it by getting in the car and, and, and relying on the fuel of God's grace and Christ's work on the cross to move us forward. And then somewhere along the Christian life, we thought, mm, I don't know, I need to do something here. And so we got out of the car and started to push. We said, you know, this is the real way. And then we look at our lives and we wonder, why am I not making progress? Why am I still in bondage to this thing and that thing? Why don't I feel love the way I should? Why am I not as close to God as I should be? What's wrong? Push, 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 push. I'm trying harder. And religion comes to us and goes, just try a little harder. Just keep on going. And the message of the gospel is, give up! Stop trying so hard. Get off the back of the car and just put your hands in the air and go, God, if I'm going to move at all forward, it's going to be you that moves me forward. And boom, the power of God flows in your life in whatever area it is that you rely on his grace. Isn't that cool? That's what God wants for each one of us. Why don't we stand together? We'll close in prayer.